In March 2011, the community of Bethesda, Maryland was living in fear. Two employees of Lululemon had been attacked whilst closing up the store. One had been sexually assaulted, the other brutally killed. Terrifyingly, the perpetrators were at large. No one felt safe. However, as detectives investigated, they would soon realize that all was not as it seemed. This is the unbelievable case of the Lululemon murder. Hi my lovelies, welcome back to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. If you are new to this channel, you just stumbled across it, it's been recommended potentially, then I release my crime content on a Wednesday and Sunday religiously. So if you like a bit of crime consistency, channel for you. Get your notifications on so you never miss any of my content. Give me a like, give me a comment, get involved with one of my live premieres. We all chat and have fun. And to everybody returning as ever. You know how adored you are, thank you so much. Also, big thanks to my Patreon and my YouTube membership subs. You genuinely make it so that I can make better content, but to anybody who gives me a view, I really appreciate you. This is an amazing space for me. I love making this content and you guys make it possible for me to continue to do so. Today's murder that I'm gonna talk about is one of those crimes that genuinely will have you taking a sharp intake of breath. So let's get started. 29 year old Brittany Norwood. She worked at the Lululemon Athletica retail store. And this Lululemon store was located in Bethesda Row, which is a shopping center. It was a high end retail complex. Norwood, well, she had been a football star at high school and college. So obviously somebody who had a lot of talent, a lot of potential and possibility. Norwood's co-worker was 30 year old Jaina Troxell Murray. Jaina was a graduate student at John Hopkins University and she was actually working towards a Masters of Business Administration. She was doing a degree in that and she'd taken a job at Lululemon Athletica because she hoped it would help her with her studies. It would provide her also to attend business seminars because she could afford to go and it just shows you that this was a young woman who really was considering a very bright future. She was certainly working at a level where we can say that she had a lot of potential and she had commitment and dedication both to the work that she did but also to the cause that she believed in in furthering herself as a human being and as an individual taking up a career that she believed in. She was described by people who knew her as very bright, loving, compassionate. She was intelligent, but also it was noted that she was one of those young women who was absolutely devoted to her family. She was very much part of her family unit and felt cherished and loved by them and also in return reflected those feelings. Also she was known to be really adventurous so she enjoyed things like bungee jumping which is not for the faint-hearted I think we can all agree but again the picture that we're seeing here of this young woman is somebody who grabbed life with both hands and didn't want to let adventure be something that she didn't allow herself to encounter and that's what she was doing all the time setting herself these challenges both academically physically and of course having these kind of environments where you've got a thriving family will add to that picture of possibility and potential within somebody's life because there is so many good attributes and variables that we're talking about as i've just described we get to the 11th of March, 2011. Jaina and Norwood, they'd been working together on a shift. It was a late shift and they'd been at the store together that night and they seemed to work well together. When colleagues were asked about their relationship, there was nothing notable that always got on. And essentially it was considered a relationship that was good. It was one of those work relationships that didn't seem to have any toxicity associated with it. And certainly they seemed to rub well together. So there were no conflictual signs there. So after they finish work and their shift, they end up closing the store. Both of them leave the building, but before they actually leave, they have to perform this routine security drill. And some people will think this is appropriate. Some people will think this is inappropriate. 
Personally, I don't think that members of staff should have to do this to each other because I think it places a hell of a lot of responsibility on the members of staff doing this. I think that's why you have security in shops. But this is what they did. Each employee would have to check the other's bags. So it was a routine security drill to make sure essentially that staff weren't robbing from the store. When Jaina looks through Norwood's bag, she's really shocked because she finds some stolen merchandise. She finds a pair of yoga leggings. One can imagine how awkward that would be. The fact that you're having to check somebody that you work with bag and you get on with them, you don't really have any conflict. And then all of a sudden there is this moment where you kind of look and you're like, oh God, actually there's some of the store's property in that bag. Now Norwood, when she's questioned by Jane on this, says that she bought them from another employee. She tries to pan it off that there's no real issue and there is a legitimate explanation for why she has these leggings in her bag. But Jane then calls the other employee and they say it's not true. They deny it. So this is a very awkward end to an otherwise decent shift. They both end up leaving the store at 9.45 p.m. And we can appreciate both of them would probably have some difficult feelings about what had just played out. At 9.51 p.m., this is just after they've left the store, Jane telephones the manager because she's gone through this scenario where she's realized that her colleague is stealing and she feels that she needs to go ahead and do what is correct. And she reports the fact that there has been a theft in the company and says that nobody is responsible for that. So she tells a manager and now that person's been informed, she goes to get on with her evening. Now, around the same time that Jane is calling her manager, Norwood telephoned Isla Rab. That's a, another employee who worked at the store. And she tells Isla that she's left a train pass at work. She then asks for Jane's number because she wants to essentially meet her at the store so she can let her in. So Isla, at this point, understandably text Jaina's phone number to her because why wouldn't you at the end of the day it's one employee needing to meet another employee to resolve an issue Norwood then phones Jaina and they agree to meet at the store bear in mind Jaina's been in a really difficult situation on the level that she's been in an awkward position with Norwood and she's having to kind of go about her due diligence and speaking to her manager about the issue regarding the theft but in spite of that she agrees to meet Norwood at the store she goes out of her way to help a colleague so what we're seeing here again is a reflection of Jaina being a really really good person she's going out of her way to help a colleague now there is a saying it's a saying that my brother likes to quote at me quite a lot. Whenever I moan about something I might have done for somebody or for an organisation and let's say they take me for granted or I get kicked in the teeth by their actions, he says, well, you know the saying, a good deed never goes unpunished. And arguably that's something that so many people relate to, isn't it? This idea that how come when I did this for you, this is the response and it's not a positive one but certainly this is something that i think is very very present throughout this case per se because jane could never have imagined what was going to happen to her next so the two women end up back at the store going into it to meet to sort this out around 10 5 p.m exactly what then plays out when they're in there it's never been established so there are thoughts around how it played out but it's never been verified entirely. But around this time, so just after 10 p.m., we have several Apple employees who are in the adjoining store hearing noises that seem very strange. So from the Lululemon store, they hear a female voice shouting, talk to me, don't do this, talk to me, what's going on? Meanwhile, they can hear another female voice that sounds absolutely hysterical. They said that this was followed by at least 10 minutes of grunting, shouting, thudding, and dragging sounds. Yeah, we know where I'm gonna go with this in a minute. Just stay with me on this one. They also heard a high-pitched squealing. One of the Apple employees actually was a bit concerned and she asked the security guard 
to go and check. She also spoke to a manager. But the consensus was that it was just people being dramatic. Yeah. Just, sorry? It's just people being dramatic? Like, literally? You can hear somebody basically asking for somebody to understand that something doesn't need to occur or that there's a different perspective that could be taken on it, just basically pleading with them to kind of listen and sort something out. Then you hear grunting, dragging, lots of different bizarre noises, and on top of that, a high-pitched squeal, and we're like, somebody's just being dramatic. I don't get that stuff. At the end of the day, why didn't somebody risk offending and interrupting said drama to see whether there was something really terrible playing out? Because that is so out of context. That is such an atypical noise to hear that that should draw anybody in. And even though this is now considered drama, they hear the screams continuing until, and this is the piece de resistance as far as I'm concerned, they actually hear a female voice say, God help me, please help me. I mean, arguably, God didn't need to help her because there were people around who could most definitely have intervened. But this is how it played out. And people were hearing this. Look, I'm not blaming the Apple employees for not knowing what to do. But it's deeply frustrating where you can hear somebody who's in a huge amount of distress, who's clearly very, very scared. And when you've heard lots of noises that are not contextual with where you work, it's one of those scenarios where a call to 911 or 999 or whatever it is in your country would not go amiss. It is something that is actually more likely to do good. An Apple employee as well said that what they noticed about that voice, the God help me, please help me, was that it sounded different to the first voice. So no one goes around to check on this source of disturbance and these highly concerning sounds. And eventually the employee who'd been concerned, who kind of raised the alarm initially and asked for somebody to go and check it out, they left the Apple store at around 11 p.m. So... We already understand that there is something untoward that's going on in that Lululemon store, without a doubt, don't we? The issue is, what exactly has occurred? So the morning of the 12th of March, 2011, we have Rachel Ortley, that's the manager of the Lululemon store. They arrive at work. This is just before 8 a.m. Just know straight away, something isn't right. The door's unlocked. So... Instantly, this is a big problem. I mean, it's a sackable offence, isn't it? If you've just like wandered off into the night and left the store open, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. So at first view, she's going to be annoyed, right? You're going to be thinking, this is really unprofessional and it's going to be very anxiety provoking because they've either made a mistake that could have cost the company a huge amount of money if they've been burgled, or even if they haven't, it was the potential of that to occur. But she tries to kind of stifle that worry and concern and she says to herself, you know what, maybe a member of staff has got here even earlier than me, they've just forgotten to lock it after they've come in in the morning. But when she walks into the store, the lights were on and she can instantly see that things are out of place. And what she notes straight away is that things look dishevelled. It's as if some kind of altercation has occurred. So she's really panicking now because this is deeply unusual. She is the manager and these kind of things haven't happened before and she knows her store and she's ready for something to play out. She knows that something out of the ordinary has taken place. So she starts calling out, see if any employees are about. I'm going to be honest, if that had been me, I'd have probably been like, I'm just going to back out of the store quite slowly, looking straight ahead at said store to find somebody from security in the mall to come back with me. Because genuinely think people should always be really careful about their safety. And when these kind of things are evident and you're thinking to yourself, this doesn't look okay, you don't know what you're gonna walk into. But while she's kind of checking things out, she hears this moaning. So of course, at that point, she's like, okay, I don't wanna deal with this. There is something really scary going on. So she calls 911, which is the right thing to do. 
Rachel then goes and approaches a man, Ryan Ho. He's waiting outside the Apple store and that store didn't actually open until 10 a.m. He got there two hours early. He wanted to buy the second generation iPad. Yeah, been released the previous day and he was ready. He was gonna get the iPad and he was gonna be one of the first to get it that day. So he was like, two hours early, it's gonna be all right. Clearly there weren't a lot of people there because Rachel went up to him specifically. But she makes the right decision because she's obviously worried about the moaning that she's heard. She's concerned about the fact that somebody could be in pain or in danger. So she asks him if he'd go into the Lululemon store with her. He's probably thinking, I just want my second generation iPad. I've come two hours early specifically for my second generation iPad and now, now I've got to go into a store with somebody who's scared and I'm scared. But nonetheless, he does it. I love it when people just go along with these things, you know. It just talks about human nature, doesn't it? That Ryan genuinely must have been a little bit perturbed by this, but of course, he went in. He went in to help this woman and to find out what was going on for her. So they both enter the store and Ryan goes towards the back of the store by himself. He entered the back hallway. This is like a really long, very narrow area. It's used for storage. And he is greeted by a scene absolute carnage absolute carnage so traumatic so he sees a woman her body's lay face down and there was blood everywhere there was blood covering the floor it was up the walls it was literally everywhere and bear in mind this man has been there in the mall to just go and buy his ipad he's been excited about this and suddenly he's walked into an absolute nightmare. He tells Rachel to call the police. He says that it looks like somebody's dead. And as Ryan's walking back towards Rachel, you know, trying to process what he's seen, the psychological disconnect of where he was a moment ago with where he is now must have been profound. He starts to hear moaning. So you can hear this moaning coming from the store's bathroom. Of course, at this moment, he's thinking there's a sign of life somewhere here that clearly is in distress. And he enters the bathroom and then he sees another woman. She's tied up, but she's alive, she's breathing. Even at first glance, he can tell it looks like she's been sexually assaulted. Rachel calls the police again because obviously now she is going to amplify the fact that this is a very, very dreadful situation, a diabolical scenario, and police need to be there immediately, as do the ambulance and paramedics, because there is one dead, and there is one woman who looks like she's gravely injured. Police officers, they get to the scene pretty quickly, and obviously they're dealing with a homicide, and a suspected attempted homicide, and sexual assault. They approach the, what they consider unconscious woman, on the floor. It's Norwood. So, she has her hands, they're bound with zip ties, her feet are bound with zip ties. They also note that her hands have been bound above her head. And initially when they're trying to rouse her, trying to kind of understand what kind of a level of injury she's suffered, she's just very unresponsive, didn't open her eyes, doesn't speak when the first officers are at the scene. They, whilst they're trying to deal with her, obviously go and look at Jaina. They can't believe it. The injuries are horrific. And we're talking about police officers who see some absolutely horrific scenes. But Jaina and the way that her body has been treated is horrifying. She's instantly checked to see whether there is a pulse. There is no pulse. She's in a pool of blood. She has a blooded rope and it's tied around her neck. There were clear footprints as well in the blood. So there were these bloody footprints that had gone throughout the store as well. It looked like they'd been made by trainers. And the police are able to establish that the size of the trainer was a size 14. So police instantly decide that that must mean that they're dealing with a large man. The perpetrator who's carried out these heinous crimes must have been on the larger size. They also notice, just like with Norwood, that Jaina's pants had been torn at the crotch. So instantly that connection with the fact that this looks like it's a sexual assault and homicide. So... Initially, just from first look, the police put it together in their heads that this is kind of a robbery that's turned into a rape and a murder. Now, this is rare. 
it's very rare that robbers rape. Usually a criminal has a particular MO and they play out their MO. I'm not saying that you don't have people who rape who also steal. I'm saying that when it comes down to shop robberies, for example, it's quite unusual that an individual or individuals will go in with one intention and then turn into other intentions. So in this case, automatically, that's quite odd because if it was a robbery, there'd have been little or no need to have any kind of sexual element to it. And they do know that the safe had been opened. There were three bags of money that had been removed. So they can see that content has been taken. It's fitting in with this idea that, of course, this has been some horrific robbery and now rape and homicide. The ambulance arrives just about after 8 a.m. and Norwood, of course, a surviving party to this horrific scene of carnage. She's taken to Suburban Hospital. They want to give her a full examination. And a police officer, Colin O'Brien, they're working security at the hospital that day. So he meets the ambulance when it arrives and he follows her stretcher into the trauma bay. There's a few things that he notices straight away. For example, he notices a number of cuts on Norwood's chest, her legs and arms. Also, she's got lacerations to her forehead. He notices straight away that her pants are torn at the crotch and There was another injury that really he connected with. It was a particular injury on a right hand. It was a one to two inch laceration and it was running parallel to her thumb. So he kind of clocks this, stands out to him. The sexual assault nurse then obviously has to examine Nord, which is just deeply traumatic for anybody who's ever been through a scenario where they've been sexually assaulted. When you have to have the rape kit examination, which is all about making sure that you can get DNA, check for injury, evidence bruising, all of these things are re-traumatizing. Because at the end of the day, when somebody's gone through an awful sexual assault, the last thing that you want is for a stranger to be any way near your private areas because you feel like they've been violated anyway. So for Norwood, Had she been raped at this moment in time, this would be incredibly distressing for her. But sexual assault nurse can't actually find any evidence of the sexual assault, which I guess is something that can occur. Arguably, not all rapes are acutely violent in a sense where it might create bruising, but it doesn't mean that the rape didn't occur. Certainly, that's not the case. But when you think about the level of violence perpetrated in the crime I've described, we're talking about two women, one of whom is dead. Arguably, it feels a little bit uncommon and atypical to imagine that there wouldn't be any kind of traces of violence to the genitalia within a sexual assault when you consider the level of violence elsewhere. Now, aside from Norwood and the injuries that she sustained, They need to establish what on earth has happened to Jaina. They do the autopsy and it's shocking because they find out that she's basically been attacked with multiple weapons. They were able to discover in that autopsy that she'd sustained more than 300 individual injuries. This included multiple fractures to her skull. She had over 100 defensive wounds where she was trying to protect herself. And the medical examiner who actually looked at her body after her death and wrote the report on this, said that it was the most defense wounds that they'd ever seen in their entire career. There were injuries to her head, her face, her neck, her back, to her extremities. So every part of her body, aside from the fact that that had occurred, she also had been choked with a rope. She'd been attacked with at least six weapons they discovered, possibly as many as 10. So somebody is taking time to return and use these different implements. Imagine the psychology of that. Imagine being in a scenario where, first of all, 
you feel that you have a legitimate right to harm somebody anyway, that in itself is outside the realms of ration and introduces us to some very malevolent belief systems and forces within a human being. But then imagine attacking somebody, then being rendered helpless because of the blows. And you're thinking, I'm going to put down this wrench. I'm going to go and use a hammer. No, hang on a minute. I'm going to go and get a box cutter. And then I'm going to go and get an X-Acto knife which is an incredibly sharp craft knife. That's exactly what happened here. And those things that I just mentioned, the wrench, the hammer, the box cutter, the X-Acto knife, they were all used. And there were more items used in that. But those alone demonstrate the kind of depravity of this crime, the violence, the sheer hostility and callousness enacted when this individual went ahead and killed her this way. What's striking about these weapons that we used is that the mass majority of them had come from the store's toolbox, which again, when you think about coming in to do a robbery, how are you gonna know what kind of tools are available for you? And would you not come in with at least some weapons so that you could overpower or scare the people that were in the store? Surely that would be something that you may think of. And the fact that most of the items, if not all the items that had been used to attack and kill Jaina were located in the store already, is something that concerns them. Even a part of metal merchandise rack had been used and that had been used to cave in Jaina's skull. Another distressing part about the coroner's report, the medical examiner's report, is that they felt that Jaina would have been alive when the majority of the injuries had been sustained. And the reason for this is back to those hundred defensive wounds, it was clear that she had tried to protect herself again and again and again and again. So they concluded that the stab wound, which she ended up having to the back of her head, that had been the one that had hastened her death. But she'd also gone through things like having her spinal cord severed. She'd also had an injury which had pierced the brain. And the problem there for Jaina is that once your spinal cord has been severed, I mean, you basically can't move. And if your brain's been pierced again, neurologically, it makes movement near impossible in these circumstances. So she would have just been unable to defend herself. She wouldn't have been able to make any voluntary movement. She would have been just so gravely injured. And just imagine, seeing that these things are playing out and the pain that you're in and being able for a short period of time to defend yourselves but then not having that capacity because you know that something catastrophic has occurred to your body and then literally being at another person's will there's nothing you can do another really distressing part of the reality of what played out in the death of Jaina is that the vast majority of the wounds that were inflicted, they weren't kill wounds. The person wasn't trying to kill them using those weapons for a lot of those blows. They were torturing them. It's not that they didn't want to kill that person. It's they wanted to make sure that their death was prolonged, that it was incredibly painful. And that when you think about the young woman I've described, Jaina was a pro-social, lovely, loving, intelligent, kind girl, successful. Why would anybody want to inflict this agonizing death on her? The nature of Jaina's injuries was so serious that her own family couldn't even have an open casket at the funeral. They couldn't allow people who loved Jaina to say goodbye to her in the way that she deserved for them to say goodbye. They get a blood spatter expert to look at the scene, to make sure that they have an understanding of how things played out. And that blood spatter expert later concluded that Jaina had been repeatedly struck while she was standing, while she was crouching and while she was lying on the floor so again you can see this kind of protracted abuse and the blood trail itself well that also indicated that Jaina had at least tried to escape her attacker through a back door so she'd really tried to run for her life understandably the police home in on Norwood because you know this is an individual who's a witness to this yes she's a victim but also she has been present during this 
macabre execution. So they speak to her on multiple occasions following the attacks. Of course they do. They want to make sure that as the only witness to the crime, they're going to draw as much information as possible out. And it's very upsetting for witnesses. It really is. And personally, I've been through a situation where after the most traumatic event in my life, I had to give statements to CID. Nothing like sitting with a detective in your mum's bedroom trying to recount something so utterly horrifying that you feel like you're out of your body and that you probably are in a coma somewhere because it can't be real. I've been in that situation, but as the CID detective said to me at the time, we have to do this because your memory is going to change and shift. We need to get as much information for you right now so that you don't have to do this again and so that we can make sure that we retain the right information. And traumatising as it is, it's important. So for Norwood, this is going to be very difficult having been the victim of a crime, you know, having to recount, but it's for good reason. So they want to make sure that they're getting all the information possible. So they start to question her. And of course, at the same time, she is portrayed in the media as this brave soul survivor, a woman who has basically been at the precipice of death, potentially. A woman who's witnessed a friend, a colleague die in the most brutal and unbearable of ways. Community is absolutely blindsided by this. The area itself, it's not used to violent crime. This is extraordinarily unusual. So people are invested. They're invested in Norwood's story. They're invested in Jaina's death. Most of all, they're invested in bringing the violent perpetrators and rapists to justice as they deserve. We get to 10.25 a.m. This is on the 12th of March, 2011. Detective from Montgomery County Police Department speaks to Norwood in hospital. And after 45 minutes of that interview, the detective goes over to the Lululemon store. After he's done that, he returns again later that afternoon to speak with Norwood because the police are just desperate to identify a suspect. So during the interview, Norwood gets to recount what's happened. And she says that she and Jane entered the store. And at this point, two men that they hadn't noticed, who were wearing masks at the time, they'd slipped in behind them. So arguably they just innocently walked into the store, unbeknownst to them being followed by these violent perpetrators. Norwood is also able to describe the attack in pretty significant detail. And she says that she got raped and she was sexually assaulted as well with a wooden clothes hanger. So horrifying, intimate details of that horrific assault. She also said that she witnessed Jaina getting sexually assaulted and raped, but that Jaina resisted. And when she resisted, that's when she was killed. So of course, Manhunt is launched straight away. They've got two suspects and there is a reward of over $150,000 that's offered to catch the perpetrators, which is a huge incentive. I mean, these kind of amounts of money, they're not to be sniffed at. And you can bet your bottom dollar. There have been cases out there that there's not been a sniff of suspicion on anybody. And then they put out a pretty substantial reward and people squeal. People are like, you know what? I think I do remember somebody turning up with a bloody t-shirt. And you know what? I do think that my cousin mentioned A, B or C. And that is something that is a real incentive. So they clearly want to make sure that these people are arrested ASAP before they get to do any more damage. Because we're talking not just about violent robbers, which in itself is a whole category of terrible. We are talking about the most violent kind of human beings. They're predators, they're sexual assaulters and rapists, and they're murderers. So you cannot get more terrifying than this kind of pen portrait of possibility as far as a potential perpetrator is. We get to approximately 8 p.m. 14th of March, and again, the detectives want to speak to Norwood. They need to piece this puzzle together. They go to her home to do so. They just want to check out whether she remembers any additional details. What we know with police interviews is that very often people start to remember things as time goes on. And this belief that people are embellishing memories because they're remembering new information, well, that isn't necessarily true. 
I mean, it is in certain circumstances, people just lie and just make stuff up. And anybody who watched the Amber Heard trial may feel that some of the suggestions that she made whilst talking about the abuse that she said that she suffered with Johnny Depp didn't really resonate as realistic when you tallied it with potential injuries, information, and other evidence that was imparted in that case. And the problem with that is, because she was remembering things that seemed outlandish, it didn't seem truthful. But that doesn't mean that people cannot remember things that are different after trauma, because you're in the eye of the storm, you have dealt with something truly heinous, your brain is overwhelmed, and you need space and time to calm. And it's when you've had that moment to take a breath that you can start thinking, hang on, this happened or that happened or they said that or they sounded like this or I remember a specific tattoo that they had on their hand and so on and so forth. These are really important fragments that together can piece together something really, really powerful. So that's why she's being interviewed again and again and again, just to check out whether there are any other pieces of information. So they're all sat around the table in the living room at Norwoods. And again, Norwood starts to talk about the fact that she'd been sexually assaulted, which would be incredibly upsetting for her. She explains that Jaina was attacked by one man and that she gets attacked by the other man. And her attacker was wearing black clothing, ski type mask, wearing gloves as well. And she said that based on his voice, because bear in mind she couldn't see his body, she thought he was in his mid-twenties and Caucasian. She said that he was approximately five foot five inches, about medium build. And she recollected hearing him unzip his pants before he assaults her, which must have been horrific. Now, during the attack, he also refers to her as a dirty slut. He also used racially abusive terms, which would be so distressing in such a scenario that somebody is being so deriding of you, both on a ethnicity level, but also as a woman, as a female, being called those provocatively insulting names, such as slut. And then she described Jane as attacker. And she said that he was bigger. He was about six feet tall, had an average build, but he was also wearing this black clothing, a ski type mask. And again, she said, just based on his voice, he sounded Caucasian. She actually became very upset when she's recounting what happened. She had tears in her eyes. She looked down a lot. So what we say when people are looking down is they're looking at feelings, you know, they're in their feelings. When they're looking up, they're looking at thoughts. So, you know, to some degree, that's a very authentic way of communicating, you know, looking down and feeling that difficult stuff. She avoided eye contact a lot as well. Again, that can sometimes be considered deceptive, but it can also be, I feel really uncomfortable talking about this information. So it's contextual. She also goes on to talk about the fact that the reason that she thinks that she wasn't killed, as Jaina had been, is that her attacker had told her that she was fun to F. So that basically having sex with her was fun and that's why he left her alive. So after assaulting her and her going through this brutal ordeal, they then pushed her onto Jaina's battered, bloody body. So truly terrifying. Now, Norwood also informs the detective of something really scary. She says that the attackers knew her name and address. And she says that the reason that she believes that they knew her name and address was they must have seen it on one of her utility bills in a purse. So the detective's like, well, have you informed your family? They need to know that they're potentially at risk. So then she does what they've advised. And of course, Norwood's family are terrified. They're really concerned because these guys are dangerous killers and they know where she lives and she's a living witness. That in itself puts her in a very precarious situation and it puts her family in a very precarious situation. So investigators are really concerned about Norwood's safety. They're also worried about the welfare of her family and her family are concerned. In fact, they feel like they want to move back to Seattle, but it turns out that Norwood doesn't want to because she's been offered a new job in Bethesda. So she's planned to start this new job after she recovers. So even though she's been through this heinous incident and her family are like, let's just move somewhere else, have a new start. She doesn't want to, she wants to stay where she's familiar and she wants to start this new job that she's achieved. 
Whilst the detectives are gathering all this information from Norwood forensics, they're also working at the crime scene. They're gathering lots of evidence and they've got some really perplexing information and forensics that are appearing that they didn't expect. So first of all, they've located Jaina's car. It was three blocks away from the store. And even though that in itself is a little bit odd, why was it three blocks away from the store where she died? What's more concerning is they've got traces of Jaina's blood in the vehicle, but that's not the only blood in the vehicle. Norwood's blood is also found three blocks away from where this violent crime played out. They find blood on the door handle, on the gear stick, and the steering wheel of essentially both parties. That disturbs them. That really doesn't make sense. And police are also growing a little bit suspicious about Norwood's description of her attackers, because bear in mind, when she's been asked to describe them and they were completely covered in black, she only had the voices to go on, she describes them as racist, raping, murdering robbers, the worst people, the worst criminals you could possibly ever describe. Also, the police are going around different shops to try to piece together what had played out on that fateful evening. And they speak to the Apple employees next door who are obviously going to tell them they heard two female voices and all this distressing content that I talked about at the very beginning of the video. Police are also then informed about the fact that Jane had reported Norwood for shoplifting on the night that she'd been killed. So now they're starting to be really disturbed about this picture that's being formed. Then they have the medical evidence. The examination found absolutely no evidence to support whatsoever that any sexual assaults had occurred as alleged by Norwood. Things didn't add up. So now we have a very different picture forming in those investigators' minds. We get to approximately 5 p.m. 16th of March 2011. Detectives they go back and speak with Norwood. This is for the third time. And this time they've brought her into police headquarters. Now there's a reason that they want to speak to her at headquarters because they literally no longer consider her a victim. When you're talking to a victim, you want to make them feel comfortable. You want to make them feel safe. You want to make them feel heard, valued. And most of all, you want to let them know that they're not under suspicion because they have to be on your side as you investigate this case and try to find the perpetrators responsible. But you bring people in for proper interviews, usually when they kind of fit the potential of being a suspect. It makes them uncomfortable. Anyone who's ever been interviewed by the police in a room when you're getting asked questions and you've even read your rights, it is terrifying even when you're completely innocent. That's why people who are innocent confess to crimes they didn't do. Because it's exhausting, scary, abandoning, isolating, and really outside of the realms of what you usually experience and encounter in life. So now they've got this suspicion that she's a suspect, they get her in to describe once again how the attack of these two men play out. She starts to talk about it, but then they kind of throw it in. By the way, do you know the type of car that Jaina drove? And Norma says, no, I don't know what car she drives and only saw it passing. So she doesn't connect with this moment. She's not giving the police anything. She's certainly not identifying that she's ever been in the car. And then they ask her directly, have you ever been in the car with Jaina? No, she says, absolutely not. Never been in that car. Don't even know what kind of car it is. But the police already know that Norwood has been in the car. She's been in the vehicle. And the likelihood is, from what they've been able to pick up from forensics, is she was probably driving the vehicle because of the way her blood traces were there. Also, got to add up the fact that the attackers hadn't been armed. Very unusual for people who are coming in to do this incredibly violent robbery to literally walk in without any weapons. And the fact that they knew where to find the weapons. Why would they know where the store's toolbox was? Why would they have time to then go to that toolbox and get those items to harm both those women? It's starting to really seem outside the realms of reality. Another thing that doesn't add up is the way that she was bound. 
So Norwood's hands had been bound above her head and they could tell that that was something that she could have actually done herself. Because if you're really going to want to restrain somebody and make it difficult for them, particularly when you're doing horrible things like sexually assaulting them, then you want to maybe restrain the hands behind the back. And they had chosen apparently not to do that. So like I said, she would really struggle to do that to herself by placing her hands behind her back and binding them that way. But that would be more believable. Also, you've got to remember the fact that when you look at the injuries list that Jaina suffered, I mean, wow. We're talking utterly horrific. We're talking, you know, spine severed, brain pierced, hundreds of defense wounds. And then you're looking at Norwood. She had a few bruises, a few superficial wounds. So there is such a disparity, such a distinction between these two deaths. And remember, Norwood is also painting the men as racist, white, sexual violators who are using horrific sexual slurs towards her, and yet they've murdered the white girl and they've left her dead, but they've left Norwood alive. So again, the description and the characters of these individuals that she's kind of put forward, they are also a little bit confusing for the police officers because if they're horrible racists, then they're probably going to have done more damage to the young woman who they feel they have a right to do that to because of their warped views on race. Now, furthermore, another thing that you have to ask yourself is, no one would have been in that store for a hell of a long time by the time that they discovered her. She could have left the store at any point during the night to raise the alarm. She was there for 10 hours with very superficial wounds. That doesn't make sense. Why didn't she try to get the hell out of there? They could have come back at any moment in time. She'd seen the form that they had. Some poor woman had been apparently murdered in front of her. And there's another big problem with Norwood's story because there are only two sets of footprints bloody footprints are all over that store and that was Norwood's and the size 14 shoe but remember she's told the police there have been two attackers so where are the other attackers footprints I mean forensically it's not as if both those attackers were there and one was very sophisticated on a forensic level and was like I'm just gonna go around with my feet just tidying up any footprint and I'm going to let you implicate yourself in this crime. That's not how it works. Certainly not in a kind of frenzied blitz killing like this, which is what we're talking about to some degree. But also, why are Norwood's prints everywhere? Because that suggests that she's moving around. It's not suggesting that the other poor woman who's being attacked has been moving around. So again, it's introducing us to these inconsistencies that are now glaring in the investigator's face. Can't even locate two people who are violent perpetrators at that crime scene. They can only locate one as far as the shoes are concerned, as far as the trainers are concerned. Then the police do what the police do very well. They start asking questions of people who know their new suspect. So they're like, what kind of a gal is this Norwood? Is she a strong, upstanding, pro-social citizen that does lots of volunteer work and that everybody loves? Or is she a bit of a wrong one? And that's kind of the way that it goes in these scenarios, isn't it? Police like to go and have a bit of a character building or character assassinating situation going down so they can start really connecting whether their suspicions could play out in reality. Turns out, Norwood's a bit of a massive liar. She also has a bit of an issue with stealing. And an example of this was her former friend at college. Actually, it was her best friend from college. And the reason that they had fallen out was that Norwood, her apparent best friend, had stolen clothing and money from her. I mean, boundaries, Norwood. Genuinely. When you think about the unwritten rule of friendship, it's like, you know what? We are tight. We are confidants. We are best mates. We do what's right for each other. You don't like go around being like, I'm gonna take that top and I want that $20. But that was Norwood. And her ex-best friend, for good reason, she had a nickname for Norwood and that was Klepto. I think we can all 
understand that that's shortened for kleptomaniac, which is a classification where somebody can't stop stealing. But it demonstrates the fact that this was habitual and persistent in Norwood's personality. When Norwood had played football at college, as I said earlier on, she was very good at this. Her teammates had actually made sure that all their valuables were locked up because she was known to be a prolific thief. And that demonstrates something very troubling about her personality. Because first of all, everybody knew that she was a thief and she was clearly okay with that. It didn't stop her going and playing football. Some people just have this bare-faced ability to know other people's opinions and not care. And to feel that what's theirs is whatever they want and that they can take whatever they want and choose. And certainly it's demonstrated in Norwood's behavior. Also, Norwood's managers at Lululemon, they had, before it was confirmed that she was shoplifting, believed that she was taking goods from the store. The problem was that even though they believed it and they suspected it, they could never quite pin the fact with any proof. So they couldn't actually support what their belief system was, that she was a thief. But of course, we all know that Jaina had done it. Jaina had finally caught Nord out. And this is where the police believe things go really dark and sinister. The police believe that Jaina discovering those yoga leggings on that fateful evening in Norwood's bag had been the trigger for her death. That Jaina had paid with her life for that discovery. Now, the following day after Norwood's being interviewed again at the police station, this is 17th of March, 2011, the police get a call. This is by Norwood's siblings. It's her brother, Chris, her sister, Marissa, and they explain to the police, some would say a little bit on the convenience side, by the way, I'm not saying that her brother and sister knew anything about this. I'm saying that it's a little bit suspicious that the day after the police are like, hey, Norwood, ever seen Jaina's car? No, never seen it. Ever been in Jaina's car? Never been in it, don't even know what it is. Could you potentially have ever been a passenger or a driver in Jaina's car? Under no circumstances, see all of the responses. It's a big fat no. Okay, it's just that we've got loads of forensic information and detail of yours in the car. I'll keep that to myself for a while. But even though they haven't confronted her at this point, she's obviously gone home and she's thought to herself, hmm, reflect on some of those questions that I was asked. Can I have a think about what some of the intentions behind those investigators' questions may have been? And I did potentially go in the car at some point. Maybe I need to have a chat with my sister and brother to talk about the fact that actually I had been in Jaina's car. So Chris and Marissa call the police and they're like, listen, Nora's been withholding information. And the reason that she's been withholding this information is she is absolutely terrified that the suspects are gonna find her and harm her. Bear in mind, they know her address. So they tell the police that the attackers had forced Norwood to move Jaina's car. Now, before we go any further with this, I'm just gonna throw it out there. I'm gonna throw it out there. Why? Why would the attackers be like, you know what we need to do mid-attack? We need to get this person that we're attacking to move this person that we're killing's car for absolutely no reason whatsoever. Like, there's no reason whatsoever in that situation, is there? Why would they ask her to move Jaina's car? But this is the way that the story goes. So then we get to the 18th of March, 2011, and the police bring Norwood in again, again, at the police headquarters. She's kind of just having general chit chat. She's talking about her plans for the future and just kind of small talk, which a lot of people do when they're nervous. When we want to build rapport with people, we often talk about little facets of our lives because we want to give them opportunities to connect with us. And when we're nervous, it fills gaps and means that the silence that is quite intimidating doesn't have to necessarily occur. But she does this for a short amount of time and then without any prompting, without any kind of questioning, 
she suddenly starts going on about Jaina's car, just introduces it. So Norwood tells the detectives that just before being sexually assaulted, the attackers actually make a move Jaina's car to a different car park. They tell her to be back in 10 minutes and they say that they're going to be watching her the entire time. They say that they're going to kill her if she dares to talk to anyone. She therefore goes to the car alone and then she moves the car. She also comments that whilst moving the car, she sees a police officer in a patrol vehicle, but says that she's far too afraid to ask for help. So I'm not going to pretend for one minute that in certain circumstances, somebody will act in a way where they do irrational and illogical things because they believe that they are protecting somebody that they love. That is absolutely evidence-based in lots of crime stories where people have literally been in public, gone to banks and withdrawn huge amounts of money, been in scenarios where they're kidnapped but are allowed to go out with their perpetrator of that kidnap and they stay quiet and don't ask for help because there are consequences associated with that, such as their own death or the death of a person that somebody has whilst they are going about their business, doing whatever they're meant to be doing for the perpetrator. But that's not the case in this situation. She could just go to the police officer and be like, this has happened. Why, when she's got in a car and she's free, does she not do this? Because these guys, can't watch her when she's three blocks away in a car. It's impossible. They're not God. They're not omnipotent, omniscient, or omnipresent, are they? They can only be what human beings are. So the detectives are like, that doesn't make sense. Why did you go back to Lululemon when you moved Jaina's car? Just, why didn't you drive away, get help? Norwood just again reinforces his idea. I was just afraid for my life. The attackers knew where I lived. But this is bizarre. You know, she's witnessed her co-worker, apparently at this point, murdered. And then she's gone back to the store. I'm going to see you guys how it... that night played out. Mm -hmm. Prior to him sexually assaulting me and zip-tying me, they made me move her car. Okay. I know where her car is. Um, and they seemed to know where it was, where she was parked. Okay. They asked, they said where are her keys, I have no idea. I don't, one of them punched me in my head and made me look through her coat and her bag for them. When I finally found them, um, they said if I was to pass to anyone and open my mouth, I can consider myself dead. And that one of them would be watching the entire time. Um, and I honestly don't remember the exact lot, but they said to like, I don't know, like cross, it's almost like on the other side of Wisconsin or something okay. from that street. I remember seeing a cop and I was just too scared to even lie down to do anything. Was that like when you left the store or when you were parked? When I left the store. So when you first left the store, okay. And he was driving past in his car? So at this point, you can understand that the police are like, I, yeah, right, what, what? Let, just, let's rewind a little bit. So let me just go through this. So, Norwood, can I just ask you a few questions? Yeah. Are you saying that after you witnessed the death of your co-worker, the heinous, brutal murder of your co-worker, you felt it was safer and you were less at risk for your life being harmed to return to the scene where two violent predators who'd already carried out one homicide were still present than it would be to remove yourself in said car, speak to police officer, and ensure that you didn't get murdered. Yeah, it felt safer going back to the store. Even though there were murderers there. Yeah, yeah. 
even though you had a car, meaning they couldn't watch you, meaning that you could just get away. Yeah. Even though you saw a police officer, literally you saw one, they were there, they were there. And you could have just said, there's a terrible thing happening. Can you come and help me? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was miles more logical to go back to the store with two violent perpetrators who just murdered my coworker because they said that if I didn't, they'd kill me. Yeah, okay. Just imagine where the investigators were in that moment in time. And to add to this, you know, it's massively improbable. The car was three blocks away, so she would have had to have walked three blocks back to the store at 10 p.m. on a busy Friday night where lots of people would have seen her covered in blood. But apparently no one had noticed. Not even the Apple store workers who heard all the kerfuffle. Yeah, no one had seen her. So what detectives believe is that the car had been moved way later than Norwood had said, and that Norwood was just changing the story to fit the evidence. And there's one point during the interview where Norwood's frustration becomes pretty evident, and she says to the detectives, we've been over this. So she's kind of letting them know, I've said what I've said, it's done. I don't want to go over it again. But the detectives say, every time we go over it, it's another opportunity for us to learn more. And they also said that, new things cropped up with her every single time. So whenever they interviewed her and questioned her, another bit of information would occur or a detail would change. And they wanted to make sure that they were getting the right story. And they say to her, this is what we do. You may not think it's important, but it is important. We want to get our facts straight because remember, you want us to bring to justice these heinous predators who've killed your coworker and really harmed you. It gets to a point where they feel confident enough as detectives to let Norwood know they don't believe her. So they ultimately say, it's not adding up. We don't believe that the evidence is fitting your story. We also believe that there is forensic evidence that places you in a scenario which suggests that you are a perpetrator, not the victim. And this is when they place her under arrest for Jaina's murder later that day. Detectives piece together what they believe had happened. So first of all, they suspect that Norwood had never left a train pass at work, but she did have a plan. So she needed to get back there. Now bear in mind, what we're talking about is that the only thing that Norwood has done at this point is stolen a pair of leggings. Yes, there is a likelihood she would have lost a job. Who knows, she might have got a theft conviction, but that is as bad as it would ever have been. That's it. Disciplinary, sack, maybe, potentially, a theft charge. But instead, Norwood decided that she didn't want to face that. She didn't want to be found culpable for that issue. She doesn't want Jaina snitching on her about that. Instead, Norwood's plan takes her down an entirely different path, and she lures Jaina into a death trap. Upon entering the store, detectives believe that Norwood had begun to argue with Jaina about the leggings, then the brutal assault begins. And she possibly even had hoped that she'd dissuade Jaina from reporting the theft so that she could kind of force her not to tell the manager about the fact that she'd stolen these leggings. But then she likely found out that she'd already been reported. And this is what triggers her. So she attacks her. Police also believe that there was premeditation associated with this crime because, wow, it would have taken so much time to inflict the 300 plus injuries that we were talking about that Jaina suffered. And also remember, she'd basically gone around gathering lots of weapons from the actual store itself to use in the attack. And those weapons had been taken from various locations. And finally, when you think about what the Apple employees heard, They heard the commotion lasting at least 10 minutes. So again, we've got evidence of premeditation. And again, remember the security officer at the hospital, the person who'd observed the cuts on Norwood's palm that had run parallel to a thumb. Well, the reason that his attention had been drawn to it, and this is just how inquisitive some people are and how 
knowledgeable they are about these things. And this is what I say about witnesses who attend certain scenes and circumstances. Sometimes they just know something isn't right. And this man, he was a former army medic. And he said it's actually caused when a blade slips from one's grip and slides down the hand. So this supports the detective's suspicions that Norwood had basically wielded the knife that had been used to kill Jaina. And of course, that had led to Norwood's hand injury being self-inflicted. Detectives then believed that she'd kind of created this scene where she looked like a victim, so she'd given herself some minor wounds, she'd slit the crotch of her trousers. They then believed that Norwood had used a pair of size 14 Reebok tennis shoes to create bloody footprints at the crime scene. Now, those pairs of trainers, they were available to her because they were kept in store so that customers could use when they were trying on Lululemon clothing. So they're painting this scene that she's just perpetrated to make herself look innocent. And then they believed that the reason that Norwood had moved Jaina's car was because it had been parked double outside the store, meaning that it would have meant that people would have been wondering what had played out and why was it there? It would have alerted people there was something wrong. So effectively, when she'd moved that car, it gave her 10 hours to come up with some kind of plan and also, of course, to doctor the crime scene. She'd ultimately staged a robbery by moving items around the store. She'd opened a safe. She'd removed bags of money. Then she'd bound her wrists. She'd bound her ankles and just lay down and waited overnight. Just waited until staff arrived so that they could discover her. So they could add weight to this belief that she was a victim. And finally, she'd tried to do the ultimate. She tried to fool the police with this elaborate tale about a pair of masked intruders. We get to the trial, and with respect at this point, as far as I'm concerned, she's banged to rights. They've got so much forensic information, and also the crime itself just didn't make sense, and we know that she's lied about lots of different things, and there's a lot of evidence about her personality and her traits that are certainly concerning and lend weight to the belief that she's guilty. So trial commences late October 2011. It's in Montgomery County, Maryland, and it's overwhelming the forensic evidence against her. So Norwood has very little choice. She stands in court and she admits that she killed Jaina. She says that after she's killed Jaina, she moved her car and she actually sat in that car for over an hour and a half just devising a plan. That's when she stages this robbery. She stages the sexual assault. So what we know without a shadow of a doubt here is that Norwood is absolutely guilty of murder, but the question is, is it first degree, which would mean a possibility of a full life term, or is it a lesser offence, so of second degree murder? Now the prosecution argued that Jaina's killing had absolutely been intentionally, been deliberate, and it had been premeditated. Therefore, they said it was a case without a shadow of a doubt of first degree murder. So the defence, of course, come in and they see it differently. They say, look, it is murder, but this is murder in the second degree. They say that it was a crime of passion and there wasn't any premeditation. They said that Norwood had just lost it when she and Jaina had argued and the argument had escalated into a fight. Norwood had lost control and the defence counsel stated this, Jaina was killed by Brittany, but not with premeditation. During that fight, Brittany Norwood lost it. There is no doubt about that. She lost control. Yes, I think we can all agree that she lost control, but I'm going to push it out there. There is losing control and then there is torturing somebody with a range of different weapons over a period of time because they found out that you'd stole a pair of leggings? Anyway, understandably, that's what the defence are saying. They're defending their client. Now, Norwood's suspected motive for the crime at the time couldn't be revealed at the trial. They basically, as a defence team, were able to successfully argue it was hearsay. So that meant that because they didn't have any direct proof that Jaina was telling the truth over Norwood stealing the leggings and she'd only had that conversation on a phone call, they couldn't evidence it factually. So even though that seems bizarre, they argued it was hearsay. So the store manager could only recount what Jaina had told her about the stolen leggings on the phone before she was murdered. So you can't apparently testify about what someone else allegedly said. Now, for me, incredibly, 
The defence then argued to the jury that the lack of motive indicated second degree murder, not first. Yeah, so just go with me on this, guys. The defence, who knew exactly why the argument had occurred, because of the leggings being stolen and the manager's phone call and all of those things that occurred within that, they were the ones who wouldn't let that be entered into the court. They were like, you can't have that. It's hearsay. It's hearsay. Not real. Unless we absolutely know that it's real, right? But then they argue that there wasn't a motive. So they know there's a motive, but they wouldn't let it be indicated. And then they use that as an argument to say that there wasn't any motive whatsoever, meaning it was second degree murder, not first. The counsel said this. That day... There was nothing going on between Jane and Marie and Brittany Nord. The absence of a motive is an indication it's not premeditated. This is not a crime of motive. That is a crime of passion. Now, of course, if the evidence of the actual motive that we all know existed had been allowed, it would have made the jury's task really easy because they would have been able to directly align the behaviour before the attack, i.e. stealing of the leggings and Jaina discovering them and telling the manager with the actual attack that occurred. But this is how the defence want to play it. There are so many sneaky tricks that defence and prosecution use, aren't there, in these cases. So we get to the 4th of November 2011. There's been an eight-day trial. The jury, they go to deliberate. It takes them less than one hour they find Norwood guilty of Jaina's first degree murder. So in spite of the defence playing the games, trying to suggest it's a crime of passion, the jury don't buy it. 27th of January 2012, the judge sentences Norwood to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. They describe the attack as cold-blooded, brutal, calculated, deliberate, devious and malicious. Now Norwood had asked the judge for the chance of life with the possibility of parole. She claimed that she asked more for her mother and her father rather than for herself. Sure, that's the one. I don't want freedom. It's not me asking for freedom. I want freedom so that my parents can have me having freedom. Isn't it you just having freedom though? Well, it is me having freedom, but it's because they want me to have the freedom that I'm having freedom wise. But fortunately, judge is like, I don't believe you. I'm completely unmoved by your pleas because of the prolonged brutality of the killing. And because more than anything, this remorseless cover up attempt, at the end of the day, if she had killed that poor young woman and then admitted it straight away and said, I've made a terrible mistake, please punish me. You wouldn't have sympathy, but at least you would see there was a humane side to her nature, even if it's just a tiny slither of it. But she didn't. She fabricated a whole cover-up. She wanted to get away with it. The judge said this, I have no doubt that you are a deeply troubled woman. However, my sympathy for your plight does not begin, does not begin to approach what I feel for the Murray family. You will live. You'll see another sunrise, another sunset, maybe through a prison window. There'll be Christmases, there'll be telephone calls, there'll be visits. The only visits Jane and Murray will have are those to her grave. Now, Norwood did briefly address Jaina's family in court, and she said, before I go to prison, I needed you to hear how deeply sorry I am. I know whatever I say today won't take the pain away for the loss of Jaina. My hope for your family is that someday you'll be able to find forgiveness in your heart. I'm truly sorry. Now, that had actually been the first expression of remorse throughout the entire investigation and the trial. And Jaina's family would later state that they genuinely felt it was just an attempt to get a lighter sentence. Jaina's mother, Phyllis, described losing their door as a pain that ripped through our bodies. The grief is like a lightning strike. I believe that Phyllis describes that very well. I haven't lost a child to murder, but realistically, it has to be the most traumatic, agonising pain, and it must rip you to your very foundations beyond a shadow of a doubt. Jaina's sister-in-law spoke as well about the impact on her family. She said, there's no hope, there's no joy, there's no true laughter. Psychologically, I connect with that so well that when you lose somebody in traumatic circumstances that you just held in such esteem and that was just a massive centre of your family, 
when their life is snuffed out traumatically, it redefines who you are and it redefines what you are. It redefines everything about your family and it will do from that moment on. The senseless nature of Jaina's murder is just astounding for me. All she did was catch Norwood stealing. You know, before this, Norwood had no criminal record. She went from that to a first degree murder. And bear in mind, it wasn't just the fact that she murdered Jaina. It was a prolonged nature of the killing. It was the torture. It was barbaric. How can somebody with that malevolence go through life under the radar? You have to have a mindset to do something like that. So is it that Norwood was simply a violent psychopath? Because there don't seem to be any reports of personality disorder or mental health issues. You know, Norwood says she just lost it. She argued with Jaina and that was it. I'm not convinced. I don't believe that she was just trying to dissuade Jaina from reporting the theft. I think she knowingly lured Jaina into a trap. It wasn't to argue with her. She could have done that on the phone. From the moment that she was caught, I truly believe she decided what she was going to do. Kind of a person decides to take a life in such a brutal way just to cover up a theft. To see you as collateral. That's what she did. She was just collateral damage. Just something that needed to be discarded so that she could escape the theft charge, so to speak. How ludicrous. And in addition to trying to somehow reconcile Jaina's brutal, senseless killing, her family also have to live with the fact that people heard the attack. You know, people could have got help. You know, the Apple employees next door. And yet, it seems like only one person expressed concern. That's incredible that no one even called the police. Norwood is obviously alive, as the judge said. She's seeing her sunrises, she's seeing her sunsets. She will continue to be looked after, albeit by the state. She's currently incarcerated at Maryland Correctional Institution for Women. In 2015, the Court of Special Appeals for Maryland, well, they denied her request for a new trial. She's now 40 years of age. She'll die in prison. And I think many of us will agree that that's the appropriate sentence that she deserves. In the meantime, Jaina's family have created the Jaina Troxel Murray Foundation to remember her life, which is an amazing legacy. And what they said of Jaina, people have always commented that it was her smile and it was her hugs, whether she knew you for two seconds or years, those were her greetings. She wanted people to feel comfortable and happy. And that's reflective, isn't it? Of the kind of human beings that we want to inhabit our society. The people who build rapport with you in an instant, who make you feel comfortable within seconds of meeting them, and who go on to live lives full of love, laughter, connection, and community. Jaina had all that denied. This case is mind blowing because it is excruciatingly clear that this should never have played out. A young woman with all the potential in the world's life was snuffed out. Why? Because of the selfish viewpoint and belief system of one individual who believed that she deserved to be free of a theft charge rather than to allow another human being to continue living their life. She was the one who was in the wrong. It was Norwood who'd stolen and yet she wanted somebody else to pay a far heavier price, in this case, to pay a price with their life. Let me know if you found this case interesting, what are your thoughts? It's astounding, isn't it, that this could occur? Give me a thought about people not getting involved and why don't people call the police? What's going on there? Leave me a comment, get your notifications on. If you wanna see more of my content, subscribe, and also give me a like if you've liked it. Most of all, thanks for joining me here. Like I said, Patreon's got some new podcasts out there. Thanks to all my YouTube members. If you want to join there as well, we get involved with lots of community chat, but more than anything else, thank you so much. See you again next time for True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. And remember guys, be safe.